So we're going to get started tonight. Uh, uh, thank you and for joining the Grand Rounds. I'm going to share the screen so that uh, we can provide you some of the details for the CME sessions. Um, we're going to go ahead and share the slides. Uh, great. So the Cardiology Grand Rounds uh, continues uh, and the CME credits uh, are available again for this session. Please text 14288 to the number 888-816-4893. 888-816-4893, text 14288 as an SMS message uh, with an active profile that you need in the Redgus Cloud CME. And for the MOC, please complete the step one and you would have a link that will be again displayed back in the chat box. The room code is future33, future33. And once you answer the questions, uh, if you do them correctly, you will have your MOC points directly populate to your ABM ID in the Cloud CME profile as well. All right, so for our panelists tonight, uh, we have uh, Dr. Brandon Oberweiss, and we also have Dr. Amna Zafar. And as you would know from both of them, that this is about cardio-oncology. And now I'll have uh, Dr. Uh, Amna Zafar introduce our guest speaker for tonight. Amna. Thank you, Dr. Zangupta, for giving me the opportunity to introduce Dr. Nealon. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be one of his many, many fellows. Uh, in cardio-oncology and uh, at the Cardiovascular Imaging Research Center. So for those of you who might not know Dr. Nealon, he's an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. And he's the Director of Cardio-Oncology there and uh, the Co-Director of the Cardiovascular Imaging Research Center. Um, amongst many positions and awards that he holds, he also holds the Mike, Michael and Catherine Park Chair in Cardiology position. Uh, just a little bit of background, he completed his medical school training at the University College of Dublin Medical School. After that, he completed his internal medicine and cardiology fellowship uh, in Dublin and then at MGH. Um, in addition to that, he has multiple fellowships. Uh, he completed, completed advanced imaging training in echocardiography, then a clinical and research fellowship in cardiac MRI at Brigham and a master's in public health at the Harvard School of Public Health. His career has focused so far on, uh, you know, he's dedicated his career to two main goals, understanding how we can improve the cardiovascular care of patients with, with cancer and the use of advanced imaging care of patients, um, sorry, the use of advanced imaging to better understand and characterize cardiovascular care. In his prolific career, he has authored or co-authored, I apologize for the background, uh, 150 original manuscripts, 40, I'm sorry, 140, 150 original manuscripts, 40 review articles, and has presented over 400 abstracts at international meetings. I could go on and on about his, uh, you know, professional accomplishments. But I know Tom and having worked with him, not only is he the most fierce uh, mentor anyone could ever have, he has, you know, all of us kind of scattered all over the globe and doing okay so far. Uh, a lot of people are doing much better than I so far managed to do, but uh, running cardio-oncology programs from, uh, I know, Cornell to literally London and uh, Budapest. Um, and I know in addition to all of this, Tom is like one of those people who's blessed enough to never have to sleep. So not only is he successful, super successful professionally, he's also the most doting father that I know uh, to three adorable triplets where while the rest of us mere mortals were struggling during the pandemic, he was writing man manuscripts and I know reading the entire Harry Potter series with them. Um, yeah while that was going on. So uh, it's it's been my honor to work with you, uh, Dr. Nealon, and we are so happy that you're here. Thanks very much, Dr. Zafar. Uh, that was very kind and uh, very much uh, not deserved, but very nice of you to say. I loved the background noise and uh, the uh, I was sharing with everyone just prior to this that I anticipate having some of the same background noise uh, the um, <coughs> myself momentarily. 
uh, the um, I just kicked one of my kids out because he does his knocking because uh, the um, cause mom isn't here. And I anticipate having to kick one or two more out uh, through the course of this talk. Uh, but as you say, as Dr. Sengupta said, this is real life. Uh, the, um, so it's an honor for me to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about the acute and chronic cardiac and vascular effects of contemporary immune therapies for cancer. I'm probably not going to talk about the effects of radiation on the heart, even though that's an important subject. I'm not going to talk about anthracyclines. And hopefully at the end of this talk, you'll understand why I'm talking about these, this particular, these particular issues. These are my disclosures. I'm going to take a little bit of a step back and this step back may not be needed for, is likely not needed for the vast majority of individuals on, on this presentation. But there are multiple different approaches to leverage the immune system to treat cancer. And in the image here on the left, I've tried to like show those multiple different approaches. And these multiple different approaches include CAR T cell therapy, and one could have an entire lecture on the potential effects of CAR T cell therapy on the cardiovascular system. The approaches include bites, bite specifics, vaccines, and oncolytic viruses. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm actually just going to focus on immune checkpoint inhibitors. The FDA, when they approves these immune checkpoint inhibitors, they approve them on the absolute understanding that you can't leverage the remarkable power of the immune system in such a non specific way like you do with immune checkpoint inhibitors without without the anticipating the occurrence of immune-related adverse events. They're called IRAEs. And the FDA anticipated that these immune-related adverse events would affect every organ system, and they are very common. So well over half and over 70% of patients who get an immune checkpoint inhibitor will have an immune-related adverse event. But the vast majority of these immune-related adverse events are very easily managed and well-tolerated. Roughly about 15 to 20% of immune-related adverse events are serious. I'm a cardiologist, so I'm gonna focus on these immune-related adverse events in the cardiac and vascular system. I'm a clinical doctor, and a lot of my research interest comes from patient interactions. And so I'm gonna present a couple of consults I saw. So what are the acute potential effects of these immune checkpoint inhibitors on the cardiovascular system? Well, this patient is a 69-year-old male, hypertension and diabetes, very mild chronic kidney disease, renal cell cancer, and he had a nephrectomy. In 2016, he started a targeted therapy, Avastin, and also started a checkpoint inhibitor, PD-1, PD-L1 antibody. Very short, very, very short time after starting that combined therapy, he presented with fatigue and shortness of breath and had the EKG, which is shown on the bottom right. And you can see the heart rate's a little fast, a little bit of axis deviation. And he also had these nonspecific STT wave changes. At the time we were doing conventional troponins and his conventional troponin was 1.25. His blood pressure is, as we would say, is a little, was a little soft and his clinical exam, his heart rate was over hundred beats per minute. The patient underwent a cardiac MRI. I'm just going to show you the cine images from the cardiac MRI in the interest of time. And you can see that there's markedly reduced systolic function, both of the LV and RV. Shortly after the cardiac MRI, the patient, uh, the patient had deteriorated. And he deteriorated and was transferred to the intensive care unit, the cardiac intensive care unit. Because of the diagnosis was still a little uncertain, he underwent an emergent endomyocardial biopsy. And on the emergent endomyocardial biopsy, the normal is shown on the left and the patient's biopsy is shown on the right hand side. And you can see this, I'm not a pathologist, and I, uh, um, but you can clearly see that the images on the right show not normal cardiac biopsy. And indeed, I showed these images to a cardiac pathologist and the cardiac pathologist said to me, when did they have their heart transplant? Because this is very similar to grade three transplant rejection. That point is important because I'm going to come to later. It's how we treat this entity. This patient got started on corticosteroids, however, continued to decline despite high doses of corticosteroids. And so this patient was treated with antithymocyte globulin, ATG, and 
had an improvement. And you can see their echocardiogram 20 days later, and you can see LV systolic function has markedly improved. So the acute toxicity that we're referring to is the development of myocarditis. So a question I often get asked is, what is the incidence of immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis? Well, the original pharmacovigilance database study suggested that a low incidence, 0.06% with single agent therapy or 0.27% with combination therapy. And there have been multiple studies since which have been trying to estimate the incidence of immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis. And these studies have reported incidence which vary widely, all the way up to over 5%. But I think the best data comes from this paper in the New England Journal. And so this was a randomized trial in patients with melanoma, where they compared single agent nivolumab versus combination immune therapy with nivolumab and a LAG3 inhibitor. And what they did in that study was they had serial monitoring with troponins and EKGs up to 12 weeks. And in that study, they diagnosed myocarditis in, with single agent, or a single agent nivolumab in 0.6%, and in the combination between nivolumab and the LAG3 inhibitor, 1.7%. This study actually led to the subsequent approval of, of, of this LAG3 inhibitor. So now there are four checkpoints which are uh, FDA approved. But actually, I think even this study is an underestimation of the incidence of checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis. And I think it's an underestimation for two reasons. Number one is that roughly about 20 to 25 percent of myocarditis will present after 12 weeks. So I think they probably missed about 25 percent of cases. And also, this was a melanoma population in a randomized trial. And as you know, in randomized trials, they typically exclude patients with a lot of comorbidities. And they also exclude patient and, and melanoma patients generally are lower cardiovascular risk. So I think that the incidence of myocarditis with single agent therapy is somewhere just under 1%. And with combination therapy, especially with the LAG3 inhibitors, is probably somewhere under 2%. So a common question I get is this. Should a cardio-oncology assessment be recommended for all patients prior to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy? And that cardio-oncology assessment can be quite simple, but I think every patient prior to starting an immune checkpoint inhibitor should have a baseline EKG and a troponin prior to starting that therapy. And it's not that we make decisions about who should and should not get immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy based on these, these tests. It's that we put them in our back pocket for when these patients present later to have something to compare with them. And the reason why that baseline is critical is that these, some of these patients present with nonspecific symptoms. They've got cancer, they, they might present with fatigue, a lot of them have lung cancer, might present with shortness of breath, and somebody might check a serum troponin. And it's often detectable. And if you don't have a baseline to compare it to, how do you know if this is a significant change? So every patient prior to starting an immune checkpoint inhibitor should have an EKG and should have a serum troponin. I often get asked, should they have an echocardiogram? Because as you know, every patient prior to anthracycline should have an, a, mes, a measurement of ejection fraction. I don't think every patient should have an echocardiogram, and I'll explain that a little bit later. The next question I often get is, should we perform on-treatment surveillance for immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis? And if we should, with what? Should, should we take asymptomatic patients getting immune checkpoints and should we follow them with a serial cardiovascular assessment? And the rationale for that is a couple of things. One is that the case fatality rate with immune checkpoint inhibitors are very high. Case fatality rate is well over 30% in some studies and in some studies up to 40%. And beyond the case fatality rate, there's significant morbidity, which includes cardiogenic shock, cardiac arrest, VT, and complete heart block. And it's much more fatal than the other immune-related adverse events, such as pneumonitis, colitis, etc. And we know most of the cases present early. 75-80% of cases present within the first 12 weeks or so. So we know it's serious, and we know it presents early. However, despite that, I don't think we should do routine on-treatment surveillance, because groups have done this. 
So this is a nice publication from uh, the um, from a group at Stanford, and where they took over 200 patients and did routine EKGs and troponins. And when you talk to these investigators, they spent their entire weeks answering emergency pages about detectable troponins. So 11% of patients in their study had a positive troponin. But of those 11%, only 1.4% actually turned out, so 1.4% of the total cohort turned out to have myocarditis. So there was approximately 10% of patients who had a detectable troponin for other reasons that was not myocarditis. And other groups have suggested, well, maybe you're approaching this the wrong way by using troponin, because troponin is a very sensitive measure, and maybe you should use other approaches. And I apologize for the, the quality of this, because this was a screen grab from a very recent AHA, public, AHA presentation, which is not yet published yet. It's in press at Jack Cardio Oncology. But what this group in Michigan said, we're going to do CPK, AST, and ALT every two weeks for 12 weeks after an uh, immune checkpoint initiation. And if they're up, then we're going to check a high sensitivity troponin. And if it's abnormal, then we're going to think about myocarditis. Uh, the, um, if it's if high sensitivity troponin is normal, then we're going to say there's no myocarditis. This is single center approach. Uh, the um, needs to be tested on a wider basis, but it certainly uh, is has has some uh, plausibility associated. So now I'm going to move on to a few slides about the pathophysiology of immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis. There are data going back well over a decade on the critical role of PD1, PDL1, CTLA4, and now LAG3 in the cardiovascular system. And so some of this data I'm going to share here. Upregulation of PDL1 is protective in, in myocarditis. So if you induce myocarditis in animal models, those animals have an upregulation of PDL1 in the heart, and that upregulation of PDL1 is protective. So if you block upregulation of PDL1 in these animal models, or you knock it out, these animals have higher troponin, higher mortality, and much worse histological injury. There are also interesting data from about 2018 that there may be shared antigens across skeletal muscles, across cardiomyocytes, and across the tumor, which may be responsible for uh, false recognition by the immune system of these antigens, or in the case of the tumor, true, true, uh, true recognition. And a lot, of our, a lot of our insight into what causes immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis has been hampered by the lack of robust mouse models. But this all changed relatively recently with this publication. The senior author of this publication is Dr. Jim Allison. And as many of you know, Dr. Allison won the Nobel Prize in 2018 for the discovery of CTLA-4. And Dr. Allison and his team created a mouse model of immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis which recapitulates the human model. So using this mouse model, people have now, be, have now begun to like better understand the pathophysiology. And what's, what has come out from some of these studies is perhaps a key role for cardiac myosin, and that maybe there is a false recognition of cardiac myosin which drives immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis. When you biopsy patients with immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis, you see an upregulation of CD8 positive T cells and some of these CD8 positive T cells, but not all of these CD8 positive T cells are directed towards cardiac myosin. Cardiac myosin has been implicated as a key driver of cardiac pathology and multiple other different, uh, different diseases. I'm a clinical doctor, so I'm not going to dwell, dwell too long on the patho, uh, pathophysiology or the, or the pathological drivers. I often get asked questions about what are detection strategies and assessment of cases. So how do you approach a patient in whom there's suspected immune checkpoint in myocarditis? And the good news, nearly all of these patients have a detectable troponin. It's highly unusual to get myocarditis, to have myocarditis without a detectable troponin. And indeed, in the patients whom troponin is negative, these are usually the burnt out cardiomyopathy patients I see who present much later after three to six months after starting an immune checkpoint inhibitor. Most patients have an elevated anti-pro BMP. The QRS duration, easily measurable on EKG, tends to be increased in patients with immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis. 
PR interval isn't isn't prolonged, and the QTC, especially if you correct it using Fidorenzi's formula, doesn't really change. So how about the left ventricular ejection fraction? And this refers back a little bit to when I said, you know, before you start an immune checkpoint in liver, would I do an echocardiogram? And I said I probably wouldn't. And the reason why I wouldn't is that most patients with immune checkpoint in liver myocarditis present with a normal ejection fraction. So six to almost 55 to 60% of the patients present with a normal ejection fraction. But we've known in the cardiotoxicity world about the limitations of measurement of ejection fraction for detection of toxicity related to traditional cytotoxics like um, anthracyclines. And so we have other approaches such as the measurement of global longitudinal strain. And so what happens when one measures global longitudinal strain in these patients? And what one finds when one measures GLS or global longitudinal strain is that there is a decrease in global longitudinal strain in these patients. And so there's lower GLS. That lower global longitudinal strain isn't that, probably isn't that important when the ejection fraction is reduced, but is very important if the in, in ejection fraction is preserved. So we'll often ask our sonographer colleagues to measure GLS. That measurement of GLS though, got a little complicated recently with this publication from uh, in the European Heart Journal from Dr. Michelle and colleagues. And essentially what they did was they said they, they gave mice anti-PD-1 therapy and they measured global longitudinal strain and they showed a reduction in global longitudinal strain. And then they did the same thing in a clin parallel clinical study where in humans with melanoma, they, they followed GLS and found a reduction in GLS, but none of the patients had myocarditis and none of the mice had myocarditis in this study. And what they found was that the reduction in global longitudinal strain was due to a T cell infiltrate into the myocardium. So there's a natural T cell infiltrate into the myocardium, which occurs when you give immune checkpoints, which can cause a decrement in global longitudinal strain in the absence of myocarditis. There are other tests that we use in patients suspected of myocarditis, and these include cardiac MRI, gold standard non-invasive test. And when you perform a cardiac MRI, which you do typically in the more stable patients, you can see all the pictures shown on the left side of your screen. These include transmural late gadolinium enhancement, subepicardial late gadolinium enhancement, mid-myocardial late gadolinium enhancement. You can see this patchy infiltrate here. You can see a mixed pattern here in F. Or you can see the absence of late gadolinium enhancement. And when you aggregate the data, what do you find? Well, when you aggregate the data, what you find is that a lot of patients, especially those with a preserved ejection fraction, do not have late gadolinium enhancement, or indeed do not have edema and black blood imaging. Roughly about 50% of patients presenting with a preserved ejection fraction with subsequent biopsy proven myocarditis will not have late gadolinium enhancement and will not have edema and black blood imaging. About, it's, and it's about a quarter when you look at the reduced EF population. But again, similar to the global longitudinal strain story, we've known for quite a while that there, um, that there are limitations to late gadolinium enhancement and, black, and edema and black blood imaging. And so we have other tools and these include parametric mapping. So these are quantitative tissue characterization approaches that are now widely available. And so case reports have started to, started to, to come out about the value of parametric mapping in, in patients with immune checkpoint in liver myocarditis. And when you pool all the data, what do you find? Well, what do you find is that about 95, when you lose these modified Lake Louise criteria, which are a combination of Lake gadolinium enhancement and parametric mapping, as well as it, uh, black blood sequences and T2, what do you find? 95% of patients meet the non-ischemic myocardial injury criteria. 48% meet both. And it, at least one of the main modified Lake Louise criteria are present in 100% of patients with immune checkpoint in the myocarditis. But there are other tests to think about in patients with suspected and uh, myocarditis. And one of the common questions I get is, well, what's the role of PET imaging, specifically FTG PET imaging? I can paraphrase this entire study by saying, the data suggests that there is no role for FTG PET in the diagnosis of, uh, of immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis. And what they did in this study was they took a cohort of about 34 patients 
with suspected immune checkpoint in a bit of myocarditis, all had an endomyocardial biopsy, all underwent an FDG PET. There was no difference in FDG PET signal between those with biopsy proven myocarditis and those but with biopsy excluded myocarditis. But that's not to say there may be no value in PET-based approaches, but perhaps not using this tracer FDG. There are some very promising um, studies using two other different tracers. One is an FAP, fibroblast activating protein tracer, which is a fibrosis marker. And another study, which I'm not showing here, is a somatostatin-based uh, tracer. And somatostatin is upregulated in acute inflammatory processes. So there's certainly promising early data to suggest either um, other PET-based tracers might have value, but probably not FDG. But when in doubt, we always say biopsy. I used to have a lot of, of resistance to native heart biopsies in these patients, and I no longer have any resistance. It's echocardiographic, echo-guided native heart biopsy of the right ventricle. I remember the first time I went to the cath lab in a, our institution with a patient with suspected immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis, uh, asking for a native heart biopsy. And, you know, some of these patients are unwell, and I was met with a little bit of resistance. Uh, the, um, uh, as one used to, as, as we used to be. We sent that patient back to the regular cardiology floor to have further discussions about the value of native heart biopsy and they arrested and died that night. And that sad anecdote has led to um, a protocol now whereby we have readily available uh, sonographers to guide uh, the, um, our cardiac biopsy uh, colleagues similar to transplant rejection. And we'll often use the information on the pathology to guide treatment. Nice study from Dr. Nicholas Palaskis, who's done at MD Anderson. And Dr. Palaskis said, you know, I'm going to look at the different biopsy, the, the biopsy signal from all of these individuals and help me decide how serious that patient, how seriously unwell that patient is. And you connect, you look at the biopsy and you say there's inflammation but no myocyte necrosis. So uh, the um, a grade 1A rejection in the old, in, uh, the, in old terms. Uh, the, um, and that patient generally does well. But more serious grades, more inflammation, more myocyte necrosis, then those patients need aggressive care. I would point you to these international cardio-oncology guidelines for the consensus for the diagnosis of immune checkpoint in the myocarditis. And so when we was faced with a patient, we put all this information together to make a diagnosis. And there's two ways of getting it to paraphrase this entire table. One is that you have, you have pathological data which confirms a diagnosis on so endomyocardial biopsy. Or if you don't have that, then you have a patient who comes in with an elevated troponin and they have an elevated troponin with one minor criteria, which is the cardiac MRI, diagnostic cardiac MRI, or some combination, or one major criteria, cardiac MRI, or some combination of multiple minor criteria. And the minor criteria include things like clinical syndrome, other immune-related adverse events, because uh, myositis and myocarditis can, uh, you can overlap a suggestive cardiac MRI, ventricular arrhythmia, a decrement in cardiac function, et cetera. And you put this all together and make the diagnosis. And once you make that diagnosis, how do you treat those patients? Well, there's two approaches to treatment. One is non-pharmacological and the other is a pharmacological approach. The non-pharmacological approach is that every patient with suspected immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis needs to be admitted and they need to be admitted to a facility which can both handle the, the workup and manage the complications. And so what are the complications? These patients get profoundly unwell, often VT storm, complete heart block, uh, the um, cardiogenic shock. So can that institution manage those profound complications? Can the institution also manage the workup? Uh, the, um, and so those are two important things. And I think both the institution needs to be able to manage both. So they'll often get admitted to a cardiology floor with telemetry capabilities. All immunotherapy is held, but that's relatively straightforward because most of these patients get these immunotherapy on a Q3 or Q2 week cycle. So it's not a big deal to hold it for a short period of time. And we always involve their outpatient oncologist 
and the inpatient oncology team, as well as the cardiology team to try and like uh, figure out the best approach to these, these patients. The pharmacological treatment of immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis involves corticosteroids, corticosteroids, and corticosteroids. Every guideline says you've got to use corticosteroids, but they say what they vary on is the dose of corticosteroids that you use. So some of these terms will not be native to us. So ASCO is American Society of Clinical Oncology, SITC is the Society for Immunotherapy and Cancer, NCCN is a national, cardio a national cancer um, and network uh, guidelines, as well as European Society of Medical Oncology. And they all say corticosteroids, but some say gramosolumedrol, and some say one to two milligrams per kilogram of prednisone and escalate if the patient isn't doing well. I know here at MGH, we always start with a gram of solumedrol. And we do that for a couple of reasons. We do that because we have retrospective data led by Dr. Lily Zhang, which suggests that those individuals treated with higher doses of corticosteroids tended to do better. So in this study, higher doses was more than 500 milligrams of solumedrol. So we always start patients on a gram of solumedrol per day for about three to five days. And then if there's a response after three to five days, we switch to oral corticosteroids, oral prednisone, one to two milligrams per kilogram. And we follow to make sure there is a response. If the patient is doing well, they get discharged. They typically will be on corticosteroids for a prolonged period. So they, you have to think about things like PCP prophylaxis and GI prophylaxis. And we taper by about 10 milligrams of prednisone in the outpatient setting and follow serial troponins and just make sure the troponin doesn't, doesn't bounce as you taper, uh, doesn't spike again as you taper the corticosteroids. The challenge with such high doses of corticosteroids is that may, we, we may be winning the battle, but we're definitely losing the war. And what do I mean by that is that winning the battle and losing the war means Yes, we're treating their myocarditis better with a higher dose of corticosteroids, but we're actually doing worse from a cancer perspective. And so these high doses of corticosteroids adversely impact cancer outcomes. Initially, we weren't quite sure, but I think the more recent data suggests we adversely impact cancer outcomes. There's another major issue, which is the rates of major adverse cardiac events remain very high despite such high doses of corticosteroids. And what I mean by that is on the graph on the left, a simple graph, you can see the increasing doses of corticosteroids by year, but the rates of major adverse cardiac events haven't really come down and are still close to 50%. So despite higher doses of corticosteroids, which we know are adversely impacting cancer outcomes, we're still left with a lot of major adverse cardiac events. So there's a lot of corticosteroid resistance because that's the term I see are a lot of breakthrough cases. And what happens with these breakthrough cases? What's the next line in therapy? Well, one of the medicines that has been suggested in some of the guidelines is an infliximab. And as we all know, there's a black box warning about infliximab uh, the, in the present, um, related to heart failure. Well, infliximab is in the ASCO guidelines, the American Society of Clinical Oncology guidelines. But the NCC and SITC say do not give infliximab. And they say do not give infliximab based on a paper shown on the bottom left out of a group in France, which said that those folks who got infliximab with immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis actually did worse. And we have some retrospective data also, which is a case control study where the kappa mark curves are shown on the bottom right, again saying that there might be a concern with infliximab. So we do not use that for second line therapy. So, but what can you use? Well, it's kind of dealer's choice. If the patient is doing well and needs an additional immunosuppression, then generally they get cells out. If they're not doing well, so the patient's having breakthrough arrhythmias, et cetera, uh, the, um, or getting progressive shock, then, the com then you can think about things like IVIG, which we use quite a bit if there's my myositis, uh, the um, ATG, abatacept, and alentuzumab. I'm gonna spend the next couple of slides talking about abatacept. So where did the idea of giving a Batacept, a CTLA-4 agonist, come from? Well, first case report, 2019, New England Journal, where they successfully rescued a patient in extremis with immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis using a Batacept. So five milligrams per kilogram of a Batacept. And a Batacept is kind of interesting because it binds to CD80-86. 
and prevents CD80 and 86 binding to CD28. So it stops that critical progressive stage of the immune response from antigen presenting cell to T cell. We all have anecdotes and this, I'd like to share this anecdote. And so this is a patient with melanoma, 56 year old man with melanoma who gets um, combination immune therapy about a week or two afterwards presents with fatigue and shortness of breath to his oncologist. His oncologist does an EKG. The EKG has a new right bundle branch block. They were measuring troponin I. His troponin I was detectable and elevated. Gets admitted to a care, uh, to a care facility. Gets diagnosed with immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis. Gets started on a gram of solumedrol per day and salcept. 500 milligrams per day. You can see his troponin continued to rise and developed complete heart block ventricular tachycardia and cardiogenic shock. The patient was not doing well on escalating dose of inopressors and they were rounding in the unit and the medical resident said, you know, uh, the, um, this patient doesn't seem like they've got a lot of options. I read a case report about the use of a abatacept in these patients. Why don't we try that? And so they agreed and gave the patient 10 milligrams per kilogram of abatacept. And you can see in the blue line here that there's this remarkable decrease in serum troponin. Patients and within a day or two in sinus rhythm off all vasoactive agents. And indeed, there are elegant mice data to support this approach. So this is a work from Dr. Jim Allison again. Again, Dr. Allison was the, the physician who got the Nobel Prize for, for CTLA-4. And you can see the mice here in the green treated with abatacept with immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis. They are doing far better than the mice here in the red who did not get abatacept. And it was associated with lower cardiac immune cell infiltration in the, in, in the hearts. So what's the suggested management of these patients? If they have myocarditis, if their ejection fraction is normal and they're doing okay, then they get a gram of solumedrol. If their myocarditis persists, that typically means the troponin spikes again or something but the patient's doing okay, then they get cell sept, which is added. If the patient's not doing well, we always involve our heart failure colleagues. And it's not because uh, the, um, our, our heart failure and advanced heart failure colleagues. And the reason why we involve them is because if you can ride these patients through the storm, and it is a storm, they can turn around. So if you can get adequate immunosuppression on board, then you can rescue these patients. And so often these patients will end up in your IC cardiac intensive care units on, um, solumedrol on multiple inopressors and sometimes with temporary mechanical support. And then we think about additional immunosuppression on top of that and the dealer's choice. We think about ATG, we think about abatacept, we think about alentuzumab. So that's myocarditis, which is the more acute toxicity associated with these immune checkpoint inhibitors. I'm going to switch a little bit to the more chronic now. And so what do I mean? So this was a referral I got for a patient, a father of one of our nurse practitioners who was diagnosed with melanoma, about to start combination immune therapy, had vague, ache, vague aches and pains, maybe some chest pain, but not typically exertional, had a cardiac CT, which showed non-obstructive coronary disease, and then started combination immune therapy and came into the emergency room about three months later. And I'm just showing one of the cine images from the, his coronary angiogram. And you can see that this patient has got mul now got multivessel coronary disease. So he presented with acute coronary syndrome, had gone from non-obstructive coronary disease to multivessel coronary disease over a period of a couple of months. And did that make sense? And it probably does make sense. As this group knows, atherosclerosis is a model of immune activation and the role of inflammation and immune modulation in cardiovascular diseases was established. Immune cells are a critical part of the atheroma. And we know from drugs like canacunumab in the Kanto study, which reduced cardiovascular events, that modifying inflammation can have a, can have a role in, in, in modifying cardiovascular events. There's this very elegant study published in Nature Medicine from Dr. Dawn Fernandez, where Dr. Fernandez and her team looked at the carotids from patients undergoing endarterectomy and separated them into two groups. And one group was individuals with, uh, who are asymptomatic, and one group was individuals who are symptomatic. And they looked at PD-1 expression, and they found an increased PD-1 expression in the symptomatic group. And I'm going to read verbatim what they wrote in their discussion. 
considering that T-cell activation aggravates atherosclerosis, treatment with PD-1 inhibitors, one of these immune checkpoints, may have unanticipated consequences in cancer patients with underlying cardiovascular disease. So they postulated that these immune checkpoints would aggravate atherosclerosis. And indeed, there are a lot of data to support that hypothesis. The PD-1 pathway has a key role in animal studies in the regulation of atherosclerosis. So knocking out PD-1 increases plaque burden. Knockout of PD-1 increases CD positive and CD8, uh, CD4 positive and CD8 positive T cells within the plaque. Also knocking out PD-1 leads to T cells that express much higher levels of pro-inflammatory cytokine genes, which are associated with this increased plaque burden. And PD-1 blocking antibody leads to a decrease in lesion size, but also a decrease in CD8 and CD4 positive T cells. There's a flip side to all this. And as I mentioned earlier, abatacept is one of the therapies we're thinking about using in, in, uh, in immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis. But there are actually animal studies where they use abatacept, which is a CTLA-4 agonist, to reduce atherosclerosis in animal studies. And indeed, abatacept is FDA approved for, um, for rheumatoid arthritis. And in patients, as you know, rheumatoid arthritis are increased risk for vascular events. And those individuals on abatacept had actually a 19% uh, lower rate of vascular events than those um, uh, who are not on abatacept. So there may be data in support in both directions that these immune checkpoint inhibitors may modify atherosclerosis. Are there clinical data in cancer patients that these immune checkpoints can modify atherosclerosis and increase cardiovascular events? And they now are. And in this study, the investigators took the fact that these patients get serial CT scans to follow their, um, follow their cancer progression and measured aortic plaque. And what they found when they measured aortic plaque was that there was a threefold increase in plaque progression among patients who get these immune checkpoint inhibitors. They serially measured plaque pre and post immune checkpoint inhibitor, threefold increase in plaque progression. The next question they asked is, did that translate into an increase in atherosclerosis-related cardiovascular events? And it did. Kaplan markers here, cumulative atherosclerotic events, coronary vascularization, myocardial infarction, and ischemic stroke. Again, a threefold increase roughly in these atherosclerosis-related cardiovascular events. So next thing groups have looked at, well, why is there a better way to understand why these patients might get uh, an increase in atherosclerosis related cardiovascular events? And they've gone back to their our old friend FTG PET and looked at the FTG PET signal from the aorta among patients who get immune checkpoint inhibitors. And the data are conflicting. In this retrospective study, about 20 patients or so, they said there's an increase in FTG PET signal in the aorta of patients who get immune checkpoint inhibitors. However, in this prospective study, there's no increase in FTG PET signal in the aorta of patients who get these immune checkpoint inhibitors. And I actually tend to believe this prospective study makes a little bit more sense. And the reason why it makes a little bit more sense is that FTG PET is a macrophage signal. And when you look at the animal studies and when you look at the uh, clinical studies of patients who have had autopsies post-immune checkpoint inhibitors, there's no increase in macrophage content. There's a marked increase in CD4 positive and CDA positive T cells. Indeed, when, I, when I've spoken to the, both the, the pathologists who've looked at these studies, they've said they've never seen an entity where there's such a marked increase in CDA positive T cells as those individuals who've got immune checkpoint inhibitors. So what I think is probably going on with these patients is that there is a marked increase in adhesion cell molecule expression in the, in the, in the endothelium of, um, and in mouse studies, this increase in ICAM and VCAM looks like it facilitates T cell infiltration into the, into the arterial wall. So that's probably the mechanism that's going on here. But we need to better understand so in order to better think about therapies which are going to reduce the risk of atherosclerosis progression in cancer patients, and will also offer like a remarkable insight into non-cancer patients and atherosclerosis in non-cancer patients. 
And so there are multiple potential approaches, which include targeting IL-1, IL-6, PCSK9, because that story is very interesting, perhaps even calcicine. But I'm going to point you to this very interesting data, as you know already from Cantos, canaclunumab, IL-1 beta. And in canaclunumab, in that in Cantos study, canaclunumab reduced major adverse cardiovascular events. But also canaclunumab reduced incident lung cancer events. And so this offers a plausible approach whereby we may both be beneficial from a cancer perspective and a vascular perspective. But this whole world of immune checkpoints inhibitors is about to get far more complex. And what I mean is that there's this remarkable world beyond PD-1, PDL-1, CTLA-4, and also LAG-3 now, which have been targeted for cancer. And so every one of these immune checkpoints is being targeted for cancer. Immune checkpoints on T cells, immune checkpoints on B cells, and immune checkpoints on macrophages. And for the next part of this, uh, the presentation, I'm going to talk about immune checkpoints that are on macrophages and how they're being targeted for cancer and why that might be important for us. I'm going to take it a little bit of a step back but before, because before I got into this, I had very little idea about immunology. Indeed, if anybody asks me an immunology question, I'm probably going to pretend my internet went down. But every, every, every immune cell has checkpoints and many of these checkpoints have a key role in cancer biology. So up to now, we've been talking about immune checkpoints on T cells, PD-1, PD-L1, LAG-3, CTLA-4. There's a couple more. TIGIT is another one. Uh, uh, TIM is another one. But there are immune checkpoints on macrophages, which are also critical for cancer biology. And one of them is CD-47. So what's CD-47? Well, it's an immune checkpoint on macrophages. And it's CD-47 is highly expressed on new red blood cells. And because of that high level of expression of CD47 on, immune, on, on red blood cells, it's like a don't eat me signal to macrophages. So new red blood cells have a lot of CD47. It tells the macrophages, leave me alone. With time, CD47 decreases and eventually passes that threshold and the macrophages eat the old red blood cells. CD47 widely, highly expressed in cancers. And so groups have said, well, if it's highly expressed in cancers, then maybe we can target it in cancers to improve outcomes. And indeed, that's what they've done. They've targeted uh, CD47 to improve cancer outcomes. But CD47 also has a critical role in cardiovascular biology. And in cardiovascular biology, CD47 is upregulated in the plaques of patients with active plaques. It's upregulated in all patients with, with uh, atherosclerotic plaque in the plaque but also is highly upregulated in active plaques. And this is a seminal study, Nature 2016, where they showed that, and then they inhibited CD47. And what, what happened when they inhibited CD47? So this is a, this is a checkpoint on macrophages. They, show a they saw a reduction in atherosclerosis and a reduction in immune, activate, immune activity within those atherosclerotic plaques. And so CD47 has been targeted in cancer patients as a beneficial effect. So it may end up being that certain immune checkpoints targeted for cancer may make atherosclerosis worse, but certain immune checkpoints being targeted for cancer may actually make atherosclerosis better. And CD47 is one of those which may make it better. And indeed, there are some early data. Again, this is on macrophages, so the uh, use of FTG PET in this signal makes total sense. And when you look at atherosclerotic signal, there's a reduction in atherosclerotic signal on patients on this drug called macrolimab, which is one of these humanized anti-CD47 antibodies being tested in cancer. For the last couple of slides, I'm going to talk about why should I care about this immune stuff? I want, to, I want to hear more about traditional chemotherapy and anthracyclines and how one mitigates uh, the cardiotoxicity associated with that. Well, the reason why you should care is the number of FDA approvals. There are over 100 different FDA approvals for immune checkpoint inhibitor, and this slide gets outdated every time I present it. So 100, different, 100 FDA approvals for immune checkpoint inhibitors. 
And the number of clinical trials is breathtaking. This is a terrible slide. You can't read it. But essentially what I, what's on this slide is phase one, phase two, and phase three studies with all these different cancer types where they're combining immune checkpoint inhibitors with targeted therapy, cytotoxic uh, uh, therapy, with radiation therapy, in adjuvant, state, in adjuvant patients, in neoadjuvant patients, in, so in patients with much earlier stage disease where the expected survival is much longer, over 5,000 clinical trials. So what can we do about this? Well, what we have, what we, because of the recognition of, if you remember the earlier slide that I put together where the FDA anticipated that most patients would get an immune-related adverse event, the vast majority would be benign and easily manageable, but about 15% or so would have a serious immune-related adverse event, and they could affect any organ system. So a lot of centers have put together what they call severe immunotherapy complications group, typically led by oncologists. And then these oncologists will reach out to the various subspecialists within rheumatology, ID, um, pulmonology, uh, et cetera, to try and like and try and get an expert who's who's interested in the immune toxicity and how it affects our organ system. So every patient with a severe immunotherapy complication gets admitted to this service. So it's its own dedicated service operating within the within, within oncology, who takes care of patients with severe immunotherapy complications, and then they consult the various organ specialists who they think it might be relevant. And the beauty of this approach is that it feeds our translational research program. It helps us better understand what's going on. And so a lot of these patients will sign consents and say, OK, I agree to, for specimen collection. And with that specimen collection, then we can put those specimens together and see what's shared across these different toxicities uh, either, um, and to try and better understand these toxicities. Also, we need to improve our engagement with industry, academia, and the FDA. It's clear these patients are getting toxicities. These drugs are being prescribed at, uh, uh, at an increasing rate. And so we need to work together with academia, industry, and the FDA to better understand these toxicities, because these are potentially life-saving therapies. We also need more and, high quality, and higher quality data. And so what I mean is we're typically working now off single center studies, off retrospective studies, but we need more rigorous data. And so here's a small plug. I'm working with Dr. Zafar, uh, uh, Dr. Amna Zafar on this trial. And what this trial is, the atrium trial, which is a BATICEP for immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis. And in this trial, working with Amna, we're going to randomize 390 patients with myocarditis throughout the United States and Canada. And we're going to randomize them to, uh, to abatacept plus corticosteroids versus corticosteroids alone, and follow them for development of immune related, or for the development of two things. One is another immune related adverse event. And second, the most important, the primary endpoint is major adverse cardiac events. So recruiting over four to four and a half years, it's an investigator initiated study, multi-center phase three, double blind placebo control trial. And in essence, what we will do with these patients is that we have a set of inclusion criteria and a set of exclusion criteria. They got randomized one to one to corticosteroids plus a bad receptor corticosteroids as usual care. And we're looking at the development of cardio, cardiovascular death, cardiogenic shock, cardiac arrest, significant ventricular tachyarrhythmias or acute decompensated heart failure. And my last slide I'm going to leave you with is the importance of this area, is that this immunotherapy has revolutionized cancer treatment and the use of immunotherapy has rapidly increased. It is estimated that 36% of US cancer patients may be eligible for an immune checkpoint inhibitor. And so it has become one of the pillars of cancer care alongside targeted therapy, cytotoxics, radiation therapy, and surgery. And the world just gets more and more complex. The, um, so it's up to us, because the future here is immune therapy. Like if you talk to Bristol Myers Squibb, Bristol Myers Squibb have, have said within five years, we will be 95% an immune therapy company. 
And uh, so we're going to have ways of turning on your immune system and ways of turning off your immune system, because that we believe is the future. And that is, if you look, 5,000 clinical trials, all using immune checkpoint inhibitors to improve cancer outcomes. So thank you very much for your attention, and I would welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Tom. This was uh, uh, fascinating. And I think um, uh, I, I just like the last uh, component of what you described, turning on the immune system and turning off. And, and that really throws, and, and a couple of the slides which you showed means that uh, we're just getting to go into the tsunami of uh, all different types of conditions that we will probably um, getting to know in the near future. I, I will obviously uh, welcome the panel and I'm sure they will have reactions and questions to you. But my first question to you is that if this is not so common, why, why do only subsets of people get it, number one? And is there a way for identifying who's going to get it? Yeah, that is a, I mean, from the, if I'm going to take a little bit of a step back, 70% of patients will get an immune-related adverse event when they start, start uh, an immune checkpoint in the birth. So 70%. So most patients get an immune-related adverse event. I think the question is, is there a way of identifying who gets the serious immune toxicities, like the serious pneumonitis, the serious hepatitis, and the serious uh, the, uh, myocarditis? And, you know, from a myocarditis perspective, there are some very nice studies which are ongoing right now that maybe there's a, a subset of individuals who have, um, uh, the, um, who have antibodies to uh, alpha myosin. And maybe that's a way of screening individuals prior to starting immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy to recognize whether some are at higher risk. Sorry, one of my kids just walked in the room. He's just hiding in the background there. Uh, the, um, so if there's a way of like screening these individuals uh, they're prior to using uh, antibodies to tropomycin, that's one possibility. Uh, there's another actually interesting study out there as well, which looked at serum troponin. Uh, the, um, so higher serum troponins within the normal range. Uh, the, um... <laughs> Go on, get out, buddy. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. Go on. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's... Uh, the, um, uh, the, I should have told the, the, the um, but uh, there's another study looking at serum troponin uh, the, um, prior to starting immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy and whether higher serum troponin values could be used as a screening tool. There's some beautiful studies in the, in the broader um, immune checkpoint toxicity looking at MHC and uh, whether there's a, 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 some MHC signal which predicts immune toxicity, better data in the pneumonitis and colitis uh, the um, world and there is in the myocarditis world. But great questions. I'm, I'm hoping that with the atrium trial, we'll have enough samples to try and like say whether some, why 390 patients are predisposed to development of myocarditis. Might be something we can answer. All right, so now to the panelists, uh, Amna and Brandon. Amna, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, Dr. Nealon, obviously that was, as always, a master class in uh, what uh, clinical cardiologists need to know about uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Um, just kind of going back to the, I, 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 I've seen that slide a couple of times, the slide that you ended on, the last slide that there, you know, in terms of how many patients who are going to be eligible for immune checkpoint therapy in the future. Um, and you went into a little bit of detail to answer Dr. Sengupta's question about uh, how we can possibly identify some of the patients who are at risk. But I'm gonna take you back to like the very basic stuff where you said in the beginning that these patients should at the minimum have troponin and um, an EKG at least done. So you have a baseline troponin and an EKG in them. If you don't have the machinery that Dana Farber and MGH have, and in terms of like a very system-based logistical kind of issue, mm -hmm how do you sort of get everyone on board to actually have these, uh, to sort of have the recognition that, you know, that, oh, hey, this person is going to get an, going to get an immune checkpoint inhibitor and maybe we should start off with these basic tests along with all the milieu of tests that we know these patients get? Yeah, it's a great question. So now in our EPIC order set, uh, uh, when, you, when you put in an order for immune checkpoint inhibitor, it automatically pops up 
that there is now an order set which follows it. And that order set includes CK, LFTs, troponin, and an EKG. And so now you cannot order a immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, for the first time in the um, simply just using an order set in EPIC. And it all okay. comes up with it. And uh, the uh, and this is a way because the the the, onco and, uh, the oncologists are like, you know, to take a step back, that order set existed originally. It would come up with LFTs. You'd have CK in that order set. And then, you know, we said like, okay, you have CK in because you're worried about myositis. Myositis is an important complication. Why isn't myocarditis an important complication? And what the, the original um, reply we got back was that, I ah, listen, if we start to do troponins in these patients, maybe they'll have detectable troponins. And the answer is sure. A lot of patients are going to have detectable troponins because you're treating, a, you're treating, you've got like an average population of 65 to 70 years of age with cardiovascular comorbidities. And so you'd expect it, but in not, not in one case, and we've, we've done baseline EKGs and troponin in over 500 patients now starting immune checkpoints. Not in one case have we actually stopped um, the use of immune checkpoints, but it's there in the order set. It's, it's, it's there next to CK, it's there next to AST and, and the ALT. And so it's now a standard test prior to starting. Awesome. If I can ask a similar type question along the same lines. I mean, the key to this is obviously with the troponins being elevated, where do you conclude that this is a clinically relevant diagnosis? And part of that is with the cardiac MRI. And I know every institution has similar um, similar problems getting a cardiac MRI rapidly, but is there a set MRI or set protocol or discussions with the radiology department in, to ensure obtaining a cardiac MRI as quickly as possible for a diagnosis of myocarditis? Yeah, and like, I mean, I work at a, like Dr. Zafar said, I work at a big fancy institution and you'd think it would be easier here, but it's actually not easier here. The average wait time to get a cardiac MRI at the big fancy place is about eight days. Eight days for an inpatient cardiac MRI when the question is myocarditis and when we know that the major adverse cardiac event rate is over 50%, it is just, I mean, it, I mean, it, it seems like a contradiction, right? So a lot of our patients, we will actually go straight in the face of this such a delay, we will go straight for native heart biopsy because that will give us a quicker answer. And uh, the, um, and, and so when we started to do that, then, you know, we, then the conversation started of ways to um, get a little more efficient about ordering our, uh, about getting our cardiac MRIs done. Because now we were just diverting all these patients in native heart biopsy into the cath lab because I could walk down to the cath lab, talk to my colleague in cardiology and say like, this is a critical question. We need to get that, this question answered. And at the same time, a lot of these patients needed coronary disease excluded, right? Because, you know, a 68 year old, ex-smoker with lung cancer walks in with, you know, maybe cardiovascular symptoms and a normal EKG and troponin, the question number one and two used to be is this coronary disease. And so what's the one test you could do whereby you could look, at, look for coronary disease and look for, uh, the, um, in the, uh, look for myocarditis at the same, roughly the same time? And that's angiography and native heart biopsy. Uh, the, um, and so <clears throat> we don't have... T1 and T2 on an inpatient setting at Mass General. So we can't do that. We do late gathering enhancement and edema and black blood imaging. And uh, the, 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 the more appropriate MRI protocol involves T1, T2, late gathering enhancement, and uh, looking for edema and black blood imaging. We, we don't have that. So we put a lot of our patients through an MRI. Sometimes it's delayed and uh, the, um, we get a little frustrated by that because the MRI will come back and say, there's no late gathering enhancement. And, uh, the, um, and then we end up having to do an, a native heart biopsy anyway. So uh, because we recognize here that time is muscle and time is clearly related to outcomes is that we started to like, unless we can streamline the MRI thing to get a better diagnosis and have an MRI which involves T1 and T2, uh, the, um, then we started to move much more quickly towards native heart biopsy.
or we develop new tools for understanding how we can derive the same degree of information for, as yielded by MRI from ECHO. So um, the reason I'm uh, pointing out that just this week, we have published a work on uh, taking the uh, radiomics approach uh, on ultrasound images to look for um, texture-based changes. Mm. And uh, we will be happy to explore that uh, maybe with Amna and you, uh, if there is an, uh, enough uh, information uh, or, or images which, which are biopsy-proven myocarditis, and we can characterize using ultrasound techniques. I mean, that'll be a fun uh, thing to do. Maybe we we'll, should explore that. But yeah, uh, I mean, in the, in, in the statistical pattern of the textures from the ultrasound images, can give you information we have shown with in mouse model of histopathological related information. That's, uh, a, that's really fascinating because in the, in the atrium trial, we're actually gathering echo data, de-identified echo data on almost 400 patients with, bio, with, with, with myocarditis. Yeah, we could probably liaison uh, with your core lab to, uh, who, if there's a core lab available. Yeah, Dinesh, uh, uh, Dinesh, Dinesh in Toronto. Oh, I, I, I'm very good friends with Dinesh. We are Great together. Guy. So, so we can mm -hmm. all work together. So, mm -hmm. but, but that's, I think we've been uh, starting to look into the, some of these questions, but uh, I believe this is going to be the same problem all over the world. Uh, it's going to be, MR is not going to be easily accessible because of the, the rate at which you will be giving these therapies. We'll have to make something more easier uh, than that. The second thing is, uh, Tom, have you looked into also uh, machine learning approaches from ECG? Because sometimes now you can extract ECG to do the same work as you would get from other imaging. Have you looked into your thoughts about uh, looking look into ECG to extract features that suggest myocarditis? Yeah, there's actually a group in Mayo Clinic who are uh, very late stage in a project where they're working directly with BMS on this exact question. And so what they've done is they've taken the EKG EKG data from Bristol Myers Squibb done as part of clinical trials uh, to try and uh, apply. Uh, Dr. Peter Noseworthy is the PI yeah, yeah. and uh, DM um, to try to answer this exact question because you know uh, the, it's a smart question, and so people have said somebody's got to answer this question. Uh, so hopefully, in Mayo Clinic, you have answers to us within the next couple of months. And or we could also do a parallel what with the trial that you're doing. So there yeah. will be EKG data there as well. So yeah, we have four four EKGs I think which are uh, part of the protocol. Uh, four EKGs per per, per subject. Yeah. Very good. So I know there we are. Uh, we have some uh, uh, targets here to be able to work. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, I think I'm sure that we are 10 minutes beyond the time. But so much excitement and I think so much more to look forward to and. Um, Thank you for uh, you know being in this uh, grand runs today, and uh, we are just uh, you know Tom we have we have got a little bit delayed in our uh, organization of the multimodality imaging, but I'm not soon going to start with all the multimodality process here. So we look forward to. But I think I'm hoping once we get started, maybe the sh the timing is going to be shorter than what you have in MGMS. So yeah, it's kind of embarrassing uh, here. To be honest, we'll try to beat you on that one. Yeah, gonna, let's yeah. try that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sounds I'm good. Uh, yeah, but anyways, yeah. on that note, uh, Brandon, did you have any other question? I wanted to make sure that uh, was there anyone uh, any other? No, nothing besides MRI. So thank you. That was very helpful. Okay. Very, very, very important to continue to work uh, and and uh, we'll have a follow-up uh, probably talk from you in the near future. Great. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you everyone. And Thank good night. you. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.